All right, so let's go through the solution to 5.1. Um, so 5.1 in this exercise, we wanted to, you to show that the lasso solution um, under its constraint, or the lasso problem under its constraint form is equivalent to a quadratic program. So before we mentioned that quadratic programs are specifically programs that are of the following form. They have an objective, which is quadratic, which means that they are quadratic with this um, matrix here, this Q matrix being positive semi-definite. Um, and then also we want to show that uh, the constraint can be written, or this can be written equivalently with the constraint, which is A uh, times beta is bounded by c some C, greater, uh, is less than or equal to some C. Right, so this is a linear function, uh, a linear uh, inequality constraint, and then we have this quadratic objective. But let's show that the lasso can be written in this form. So the first thing is to show that we can show that um, this objective is quadratic. And if we think about, um, so this, this is not exactly going to be the whole answer for the objective, but we'll, we'll go through this uh, one by one. So this objective is quadratic. You have beta transpose x transpose x beta is going to be um, the first part of the expansion of this two norm. So remember, we can write this as one half of the two norm between y minus x beta right, squared. And then just expand that two norm using inner products. And we've done this before. Um, you end up getting this type of an objective that looks like this, where c is some constant uh, based on y. It's just the two, two norm of y squared divided by 2. So this thing, let's, let's look at it. Um, you have this quadratic term, and you have an x transpose x, right? and then you have a linear term. You have beta transpose x transpose y. And this should be familiar to you. If you take the derivative of this, gradient of this with respect to beta, then you get x transpose x beta is equal to, if you set this equal to 0, you get x transpose x beta is equal to x transpose y, which are the normal equations. So that should feel familiar to you. We know that x transpose x is positive semi-definite because a transpose times x transpose x a, and for any a, this is equal to the two norm of x times a squared, which is always positive, where it's not negative. Right? And so we have that, that's, that's what the positive semi-definite means. Um, so we have that this is positive semi-definite, and this is a quadratic optimization. But what about that one norm? This was the this was the tricky part. Okay, so we have this quadratic term. So it's we've written it out, but this linear part, um, and this is the one norm. This is not a linear function by any means. The absolute value is not a linear function. But remember my hint. My hint was that. Um, we can separate um, each component into a positive and a negative part. So we're just going to separate beta j into the positive part and the negative part. And this is just beta j uh, if it's positive, and this is negative beta j if it's negative. So before I wrote beta positive j and, and beta negative j, instead I'm just switching it around, saying that I'm taking the positive part of the scalar here. Um, and this is with, with both of these are, are, are restricted to be positive. And we, we can always do this. You have, um, if, if you just say, this is, effectively, this is an if and only if, right? If you say that beta j is written as one positive number minus another positive non-negative number, then, um, then this is a unique decomposition, right? Because you can go, go from beta j to the positive and negative parts just by seeing whether it's positive or negative. And you can go the other way around, right? Um, if uh, if j plus, sorry, this is not a unique decomposition, um, but we don't need it to be unique. Sorry. Um, you can go in one direction. Um, sorry, I was, I was talking too fast there. Um, then the one norm of beta, this is equal to the sum over j's of the beta j positive plus beta j minus, beta j plus plus beta j minus, right? And so, um, Right. And th there's actually some something tricky here when it comes to the uniqueness of this, right? Because we could add a constant to this beta j plus and the same constant to beta j minus. It doesn't change this beta j, right? So we have to worry about that a little bit. 
Um, but if we do that, then it'll just it'll strictly increase this this one norm. Right? And because the one norm is constrained, then um, it's only going to violate the constraint. It won't change the beta j, but it can only the only thing it could do is violate this constraint. And so we, without loss of generality, we can assume that these things are uh, not both zero, right? You set one equal to zero and one equal to um, one uh, greater than or equal to zero. Right? Without loss of generality, we can assume the solution to the lasso form uh, satisfies that. And you might want to, you know, step back and think about that for a little bit. Um, but the basic idea is that while we could add um, and without changing this this objective here, because it doesn't change beta, we could add the same constant to both the positive and negative part here. Um, that the only impact on this object on this optimization problem is to increase the one norm. Our our one norm, we're going to write it as you know um, as the sum over j's of the positive plus the negative part. It's going to only increase this constraint. So now um, the the idea is that we want to rewrite this um, the constraint into a um, into a linear function. And so the basic idea is let's re-express it as beta j plus and beta j minus. And because the original objective was quadratic and beta, and this is linear here in the beta j plus and beta j minus, you can show that this is also quadratic in beta j plus and beta j minus. Now, um, now let's think about this uh, one norm. You have this sum, so we have we have this positivity constraint first. But these constraints, these positivity constraints, are linear, right? So that's the first thing that we want to observe is that we have these linear constraints on inequality constraints on on the beta j plus and beta j minuses. The, the infinity norm, we can write this as the sum of beta j plus plus beta j minus. So that's just summing up all of them. And then we're going to constrain that by C. Right? So we can write this whole, all of these inequality constraints in the following way. We just put ones everywhere here, and then let's stack the positive and negative parts on top of each other. Right? So now when we take the inner product of this row with this, with the betas, then we end up getting this one norm, and that's bounded by C. Now, how do we make these uh, positivity or non-negativity constraints? Well, we just say, well, let's put a minus one here, and then a minus one here. In the this is in the um, one uh, the two one component of this matrix. This is in the um, three two component of this matrix, and so on on the along this diagonal. And then um, and then what that this will do is when we multiply this. Um, row by the betas, it'll pick out this first beta, beta 1 plus. And then we just say, well, that has to be less than or equal to 0. Right? And that negative 1 times the beta 1 plus is going to say that this beta 1 plus has to be greater than or equal to 0. So we're going to enforce these constraints by writing uh, this, di adding this diagonal matrix, stacking it on top of, on, on top of this A. Um, and then we also satisfy the one norm constraint. And now, um, and now it, it'll take a little. It takes a little bit of thinking to show that if there is a solution to this per, if there is a solution to this program, then we can just make it so that beta j plus and beta j minus are the positive and negative parts of a of a scalar. And then uh, we have a solution to the constrained form of the lasso. So there's actually some a little bit more. Um, to this than what I described right here. But so this is actually a pretty tricky problem. Um, a lot of people get tripped up on this. Um, but mostly it has to do with the um, existence and uniqueness of, of these solutions. OK, so let's solve the last. So for a single lambda or C in the constrained form, so we might be solving um, the regularized form or the constrained form if we want to solve a QP. We can solve a lasso with many specialized methods. So we can do um, a, a QP solver. So we could do, use quadratic programming uh, like we showed before. There's other methods out there that are that, that work pretty well for this for this type of 
uh, for, for the lasso. There's proximal gradient algorithms. There's ADMM type methods. Uh, this is another uh, optimization, uh, optimization uh, class of optimization methods that we won't go into in this class, but just know that these exist. And they're for, for solving a single lambda, right? So we went through one, QP. Um, there exist QP solvers. Uh, these are methods that are specialized to the quadratic programs. But suppose we um, are tuning lambda or C, right? Suppose we're tuning it. Then we want um, for a given Y, for a given X, to find the solution for a bunch of different lambdas, right? So there's a couple of options. We could just construct a grid of the lambdas and solve each lasso problem in sequence. Now, um, it turns out that we can look at what, how the, how the solutions change as a function of lambda and solve uh, this thing simultaneously for all lambdas. And this is what's called a path algorithm, or you know, it, it can solve them in sequence. So um, we're going to study a little bit what's known as the lasso path and um, try to understand more deeply these uh, path algorithms. OK. So but before we get into that, let's think about the, what's known as active sets. Let's, let's um, talk about active sets. So if we let beta hat lambda be the beta hat at a tuning parameter lambda, right? So this is just a, a re-expression of, of, of uh, beta hat. So we're just calling beta hat sub lambda, the beta hat that we get for the lasso in its regularized form at a tuning parameter lambda. Now um, I claimed and I sort of argued that if lambda as we change lambda, we're going to get some of these beta hats to some of the components of beta hat to be zero, right? So let's consider the non-zero components. This is called the support of this vector beta hat lambda. And let's just call it that calligraphic A sub lambda, right? So this is a set um, of the elements from one to P right? of, the, of, the, of the different components. Um, and so what I claim is that for large lambda, if lambda goes to infinity, this active set is going to approach zero. Um, and throughout this, I'm, I'm ignoring the intercept term. Generally, just like in most regularization problems, we, um, we don't ignore the intercept. We, or sorry, we ignore the intercept in our penalty. So this is a bit of um, details that I didn't want to get too much into here. But typically, we're going to ignore our, our, um, our intercept term. So for a large lambda, um, so th this, this in this case, that's in practice. But in this case, just imagine that the intercept is also being penalized, um, or we don't have an intercept at all. So for large lambda, if it's approaching zero infinity, then this active set, I claim, is going to approach the empty set. So the size of the active set is approaching zero. Right? And so for, for small lambda, lambda equal to zero, then this active set in size is um, going to approach P. Um, and this, this is sort of assuming that the ordinary least squares doesn't have zeros in the beta hats. Um, so I, I want you to argue that this is the case. Um, it doesn't have to be a full-fledged mathematical argument. That can actually be a bit non-trivial. But just, just try to convince yourself that this is the case, and make that a, we'll make that an exercise just for fun. But just think about why this would be true. Now, forward degree selection, um, what we saw before, it just adds elements to the active set. Right? And so this was, um, this was the first method that we introduced to attempt to solve the um, the uh, subset selection problem, the NP-hard subset selection problem. We just added elements to the active set that improved our objective. Right. Um, so let's see why that would go wrong and why the lasso might actually be a superior superior alternative to this. So if we think about the active set um, for forward greedy selection, you know, um, suppose we have this follow this, this following picture. We have y, it's really this is somewhere outside of um, the x space. You, you would imagine this being actually in four dimensions, for example, or even more dimensions than four. Um, but that's hard to depict. 
So we have our x1 and our x2, and then our x3 looks uh, mostly like a linear combination of this. Maybe it has some other um, non-trivial component. y is some other vector that if you just look at the, um, the correlations between y and all of the x's, you would see that the correlation between y and x3 is the largest. Just suppose that that's the case. Then if you did ordinary least squares, if you tried it for each of these individual x's, um, that's just um, single variable le um, linear regression is just going to look for the largest correlation between y and x. That's what linear regression does. And so it would find that x3 is most correlated with y, and so it would add 3 to the active set. Then. Um, then it would go after that, um, greedy, uh, the greedy method, so this is the forward stepwise, is going to look for the next most correlated um, x with the residuals. That's effectively what running OLS on um, the next ones, the next one is going to do. And so maybe then um, it'll find that x1 is the best uh, to add in. And so x3, um, 2x3 gets added x1, right? and now this is 3, 1 is the active set. But now that we've added 1 in, um, perhaps it's the case that 3 actually wasn't, isn't the most useful um, when we consider that 1 is already in the active set. So even though 1 wasn't ad added into the active set first, it might have been if we had 1 in the active set, we would have added x2 instead of x3 because it explains more of the variance perhaps. Um, in y. But because we've added 3 in, we would then next add 2 in, just because that would be all of the remaining variables, and it can only improve your ordinary least squares training, training error to add in more variables. And so we would get 3, 1, 2 into the next active set. But it might be that if we had, um, if we were able to swap 3 with 2, we would get an active set of size two that could have higher, um, could have smaller square error loss, just because x1 and x2 are sort of more orthogonal to one another, and maybe they explain more of the variance in y. So, so the basic idea is that um, it can it can be the case that you add in a variable at the beginning that is most correlated with y. But because it's, a, it's also correlated with the other variables, right, its effect could be explained very well with, with other variables, and we could actually drop it from our active set without much repercussions. So that can happen quite, quite easily. Um, and so the lasso, because it's not greedy, it can do this. It can actually drop um, these uh, these these um, regression coefficients, which from the active set, which might um, be uh, something we would have added in first, just because it's highly correlated with the response. And this, this um, in particular happens when you have highly correlated, when you have correlated design. This is something that, that happens in particular in that case. So the lasso path, and the basic I, the way we can think about it is we just start at lambda equals infinity. So this is an idealized thing. It's not an actual algorithm, but this is idealized. We start at lambda equals infinity, and I claim that beta hat was equal to zero in that case. Right? And basically the idea is that the penalty then dominates in this case. And the best thing for the penalty is to set beta hat equal to zero. Then we just think about decreasing lambda until one of the coefficients is non-zero. So we just decrease it until something starts to be non-zero. And then we add that coefficient into the active set. We call this a hitting event. Then we just continue decreasing lambda, and this active set is going to change as we decrease lambda and approach zero, and there's going to be some things entering in, some things uh, leaving, some leaving events. Um, so we call these hitting and leaving events, respectively. So some elements will add into the active active set, some elements will leave the active set. Um, and the, it turns out that if you think about the lasso path, it turns out that the, um, 
the predictor variable that's most correlated with y is going to be the first element to enter into the hidden event. So just like before with greedy, the first for greedy stepwise, the most correlated variable with y was added in first. That was that was um, that's some commonality between the lasso path and greedy selection. But critically, elements can leave the active set as we decrease lambda. Whereas in greedy selection, nothing forward greedy selection, nothing can leave the active set. Um, so those hidden events are when an element is added to the A. A leaving event is when it's removed from A. Our beta hat is, um, it turns out that if you think about beta hat lambda J, and this is a critical thing about this lasso path, is that it's piecewise linear, it's continuous as a function of lambda. So as I change lambda, you can actually see that these beta hats form lines, piecewise linear, um, continuous functions. And the these uh, these points at which these this uh, the slope of this line changes because it will change the slope will change the point at which this happens these are knots and they are hitting and leaving events so these are times at which the active set actually changes so we just have to look at the lasso path when we're looking at the lasso path we look at what the change in the beta hat is and then we look for times in which an element hits it enters into the active set or it leaves the active set. And then we update what this line is. So these are properties that give us an actual algorithm for computing the lasso path. So this is a picture of the lasso path. This is an example of the lasso path. So if we look at it, um, so what I'm going to do, instead of plotting it as a function of lambda, I'm plotting it as a function, this is standard um, for, um, uh, for the lasso, it's a bit more informative to look at the size of the coefficients divided by the norm of the coefficients divided by the maximum norm of the coefficients so that you get something that goes from, ranges from 0 to 1. Turns out that this is also a linear function of lambda. So you end up getting that your coefficients are still a linear, piecewise linear function of this. And you still have that this is, and this is monotonic, so this is, you still have that this is a, um, you still have that these not points at which the slope changes are times at which things enter or leave the active set. Right. So this is a standard way to plot your lasso path. But you start at lambda being extremely large, which has your beta hat equal to zero. So there's some lambda at which um, beta hat is equal to zero. And then as you, um, as you move along lasso path, you have some um, lines for the first coefficient that's in the active set. And then what we see here is that another element is added into the active set as we decrease our lambda, which is equivalent to increasing this. Right? And then, so we have two elements of our active set, and then something happens, another element adds into our active set. So at this point, our active set has three elements. And this continues, another element adds into the active set. And notice, every time there's a hidden event here, the slopes of these lines changes, and we have to recompute these slopes. We have another hitting event here. We have another hitting event here and here and here and here. We don't have a leaving event until here, where this pink line leaves, and then it actually enters in again. We have another entering. We have another hitting event, and then this final solution is the ordinary least square solution with lambda equals to zero. Okay, so let's consider a method, and then we'll see what the connection to the lasso solution is. So this is a method that's very similar in nature. We're just going to standardize our predictors first. So this is when we have to deal with an intercept. Um, so this is accounting for the intercept. It's equivalent to doing this whole thing with y uh, centered. But let's just subtract the mean of y off of, off of this. And we'll also have our centered uh, x's, and typically we're also going to normalize, standardize our x's for this for the for this problem. So we start with this residual, and we'll start with beta hat equal to zero. So this should feel like where we started here, right? We've centered our y's so that we've accounted for the intercept. We set our beta hat equal to zero, 
And then let's find our xj most correlated with r. So this is just the correlation between y and xj, and find the one that's most correlated with r. So just like step, uh, greedy, the greedy method, just like um, what I described for the first uh, active set of the lasso, this j is going to give us the first active set. It's just going to be the first element of the active set. Now, we're going to move beta j in the direction of the inner product between x, x and r, xj and r. Right. And so this this should this should be the um, covariance between these if x's are standardized. So we're going to move beta j in the direction of this covariance, and then this is going to happen until this residual is more co correlated with another xk. Right. So until the so we're going to continue to move this. This is re residual is going to change, and then it's going to sort of remove this correlation between. Um, the xj and r as this residual changes as we move in this direction, as we increase beta j, and then something else is going to eventually be more correlated. And so then we add that into the active set. Now we have beta j and beta k, and now we think about um, the ordinary least squares coefficients of regressing r, our current r, onto this beta j and beta k. And then we move in the direction of these two um, in, their, in the direction of their OLS coefficients until another one has more correlation with the current residual. We just continue doing this, adding in the Ls, um, and we continue until all predictors have been entered. So this is a method that's very similar to what I described before. Um, I was a, a little bit vague um, about what it means to move in the direction of an OLS coefficient and how this residual update works. Um, maybe I can point to uh, maybe just reading more in elements of statistical learning about these details, or we can point to um, uh, uh, papers on, on, the, on this topic, the original Lars paper. Um, so we just continue until all predictors have been entered, um, and this, this is the least angle regression method. So I, I've been describing the lasso solution, um, and, um, but I, I claim that the uh, least angle regression as I've presented it here does not solve the lasso. So take a moment to think about why that's, uh, why that's the case, why least angle regression, how we know that least angle regression does not solve the lasso solution here. Yeah. Okay. So it turns out that lasso, um, the lasso modification, um, th that first of all, I'll just answer this. <laughs> the lasso solution, um, like I said before, there are these leaving events, these places in which um, these coefficients uh, leave the active set in the lasso path. But in least angle regression, that never happens. That's never explicitly forced in least angle regression. There's only hitting events here. So we're going to have to modify this if we hope for this to look like the lasso. The lasso modification says that if a non-zero coefficient drops to zero, so as you move in this direction of the ordinary least squares, that, um, that OLS coefficient, that is the slope of, the OLS coefficient is the slope of these lines. Right? That's what I, that's how we defined our uh, least angle regression. And sometimes those slopes could be in the opposite direction of the sign of the, of the current coefficient. And so it could force it eventually to go past zero, right? Because we're moving in that direction. Um, and so when it hits zero, um, what we're going to do is just allow it to drop. So now we allow it to leave the active set so it can stay zero for some period of time. It could get entered back in with another hitting event, but we're just going to allow it to leave the active set. Um, when, it, when it does this, this is a simple modification and it actually makes least, uh, least angle regression. This with the lasso modification um, it makes this actually solve the lasso path. So that's something that you can prove. You can just show that the lasso path satisfies all of these properties here. Okay, 
So if we look at least anger regression versus the lasso, this is a uh, figure from Elements of Statistical Learning. If we look at the difference between these least angle regression, there's going to be some coefficient that drops to zero. We're going to allow it to stay zero for a period of time. This L1 arc length is similar to the, um, the previous um, thing that we've seen. It is the same. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to enter in a data set. Um, it's this hitters data set. It's from the uh, James A. All book, The Intro to Statistical Learning. Um, and you can find um, this, this uh, code has been modified from a, a GitHub repository. This is from labs from that book. Um, but it's just to show uh, how the lasso works. But uh, please, please look at these, um, these references. Um, Okay, so we're going to work with that data set in a minute, but first let's just simulate a data set for the lasso. Um, so the first, uh, the thing we're going to do is we're going to set N, which is the number of samples to be 100. We're gonna set P equal to 1000. So we're actually setting P greater than N. There was nothing about any of this analysis that said that P had to be smaller than N. So this is somewhere where we really depart from ordinary least squares. And we're going to generate a random axe that's scaled. Um, then we're going to we're going to find a, a, a subset of the variables, which is two percent of the variables, which we're going to call the active set. So we're going to it's it's in expectation it's two percent of the variables. We're going to set them equal to um, non-zero. Then everything else is zero. So um, so we're going to create a true active set. Um, and then we're going to create betas where they're zero unless it's in this, in this true active set. So we, don't, we shouldn't have access to this true active set, but the betas are equal to some mu times uh, just random variables. Okay. And then, um, then we're going to solve the, we're going to create a linear system. I'm using Python 2 notation here, um, but bear with me. Okay, so as an exercise, um, I would run the lasso using um, the Lars path. There's a flag for the lasso modification. So in general, you can look at doc strings using this type of line here, the um, question mark linear model dot Lars path. You can see what the uh, how to how to set the lasso modification. I think it's just method equals the string lasso. And then let's plot the lasso coefficients that are learned as a function of lambda. So um, let's just see how the lasso coefficients change as it changes as you change lambda. Typically they should get small and then go to zero as lambda goes to infinity. Um, and then create a plot um, where the x-axis is lambda and the y-axis is the coefficient value. So you're going to get a bunch of lines. There's 1,000 uh, coefficients and so each of them is going to be plotted. But um, to make it easier to see, highlight those uh, those coefficients that are truly non-zero. So you have this S bool, it's a set of non-zero uh, coefficients, or it's a list of non-zero coefficients. Go through those and plot those in red instead of black. Um, so we don't, we typically wouldn't have access to this, but for us, we're simulating, so we might as well just see what they, what those lines look like versus all of the other lines. Okay, so take, take a minute to do this. Um, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll pick up in the next video.